OK, let's compare answers. Number one, compare Prospero's conversation with Miranda to his conversation with Ariel. Are they similar? And if they are similar, how are they similar? So let's take a look. What did I say? One, two, 66. Right, so uh, starting from line 66, Prospero starts telling the story of how they got to the island. And then as he's talking, suddenly he asks, this is the next page, dost thou attend me? So are you listening? Uh, in modern English, th this is do you attend to me? Are you paying attention? Are you listening? And Miranda says, sir, most heedfully. Yes, I'm listening very carefully. And so he continues telling the story and then he says, thou attends not. You're not paying attention. So like as he tells the story, he seems to really care about Miranda's reaction. Uh, and then like, where did I say this ends? 187, okay. Um, like the story is, is really long because this is the main focus of the, of this act one. And finally near the end of the story, or I guess at the end of the story, he says, uh, this is page 1578, line 185. He says, here cease more questions. So stop asking questions. Thou art inclined to sleep. You want to sleep. Tis a good dullness and give it way. So it is good to fall asleep. So go to sleep. I know thou canst not choose. And so Miranda sleeps. So like from this, we can see that the, the focus of this conversation is not really on Miranda, right? He's trying to share information to his daughter and he's trying to make sure that his daughter is paying attention. Finally, when she can no longer stay awake, he lets her fall asleep. So like he's the one in control of this conversation. Well, what about his conversation with Ariel, 251 to 98? This is page 1579, 251. Okay, so like uh, Ariel, his magical servant comes he gives Ariel some orders. And then Ariel reminds Prospero that Prospero has promised to give him his liberty or freedom, promised to let him go. Uh, I pray thee, which means I pray, which means please. I remember I have done thee worthy service told thee no lies, made thee no mistakings, served without or grudge or grumblings. This in modern English, we would say without either grudge or grumblings. So uh, I don't feel resentment. I don't complain. Thou did promise to bait me a full year. So you did promise that you will let me go a year early. And Prospero's response to this is, dost thou forget from what a torment I did free thee? Torment here means suffering. So did you forget how you suffered before I freed you? Ariel, no. So like he remembers. Prospero, Thou dost, and thinks it much to tread the ooze of the salt deep, 
to run upon the sharp wind of the north, to do me business in the veins of the earth when it is baked with frost. So Prospero here is saying, you remember how I saved you, yet when I ask you to do things, you think that it's too much. You think that I ask you to do too much. Ariel says, I do not, sir. Prospero, thou liest, malignant thing. So you're lying, you evil thing. Hast thou forgot the foul witch Sycorax, who with age and envy was grown into a hoop? Hast thou forgot her? Ariel, no, sir. Prospero, thou hast. Where was she born? Speak, tell me. Uh, and so this is an excuse to uh, recall the history of how Ariel became Prospero's servant. So basically the witch Sycorax used to live on this island. She is Caliban's mother. Uh, and it says here, line 276, she did confine thee, so she restricted you. She closed you up by help of her more potent ministers, so some of her more powerful servants. And in her most unmitigable rage, when she was most angry, she did confine thee into a cloven pine, a pine tree that was split in half. She shut you up inside. Within which rift, the, the opening part, imprisoned thou didst painfully remain a dozen years. So she shut you up in that tree for a dozen years. Within which space she died. Uh, space means time. I know it's confusing. Space means time. So within this time period, she died and left thee there where thou didst vent thy groans as fast as mill wheels strike. So you kept on groaning and groaning because you were suffering. And then 288, thou best knowest what torment I did find thee in. Thy groans did make wolves howl and penetrate the breasts of ever angry bears. That you were suffering so much that the wolves and the bears would also feel how much you're suffering. It was mine art, it was my magic, when I arrived and I heard thee, that made gape the pine and let thee out. So you were suffering so much and it was me, I was the one who saved you. Ariel, I thank thee, Master. Crossbow, if thou more murmurst, so if you complain even more, I will rend an oak, I will split open an oak tree and peg thee in his naughty entrails till thou hast howled away twelve winters. So he's saying, if you complain again, I will shut you up in another tree for another twelve years. Ariel, pardon, master, I will be correspondent to command. So I will obey your commands and do my spriting gently, and I will obediently do my duties. Prospero, do so, and after two days, I will discharge thee. I will let you go in two days. So, how does he talk to Ariel? He talks to Ariel as a master to a servant in the sense that he keeps reminding Ariel of why Ariel is his servant. He's also using storytelling as a kind of control. So like of course, his daughter and his servant are two very different kinds of relationship with him. So we don't expect him to behave similarly to both. But we see that there is some similarity. In both cases, Prospero is telling stories. 
he is the person in control of these conversations. Uh, the difference, of course, is that to Miranda, he's giving her information, and so he wants her to pay attention to this story. To Ariel, it's the other way around. He wants to control Ariel, therefore he is telling the story. So with Miranda, control is for the story, but for Ariel, the story is for control. Um, but in either case, we see that he is the one in charge. He is the one with the information. He is the one in control. And, you know, depending on how you think about uh, his behavior toward Ariel, maybe you might think he's using emotional blackmail. Um, but that depends on your perspective. In any case, now we have a better picture of what kind of um, behavior, how he talks to other people. Question two, nobody took this question, so let's look at this. This part of the play, three, uh, one, two, three, five, four. Here, same page. Here, it says that Miranda says these words. And the question is, should this be Prospero talking? Did the editor make a wrong choice? So let's see what this is saying. Uh, this is where we are introduced to Caliban. And we get the story of how Caliban became Prospero's slave. And the basic story is the island used to belong to Caliban. Then Prospero came, some things happened. Caliban tried to rape Miranda. And here Caliban says, oh ho, oh ho, would it had been done if only I had succeeded. Thou didst prevent me. I had peopled else this isle with Caliban's. If you did not prevent, if you had not prevented me, this island would be full of my children. So, you know, it, he has not changed. He has not regretted trying to rape Miranda. And this is basically why he is still a slave to Prospero. But then we have the next section, and it says that Miranda says this. A borrowed slave, which means horrible, horrible slave. Which any print of goodness will not take. No matter how I we try to imprint goodness on you, it does not stick. Being capable of all ill, you are able to do anything that is evil. I pitied thee, took pains, which means made effort, to make thee speak, which means I taught you language. Taught thee each hour one thing or other. I kept trying to educate you. When thou didst not, savage, know thine own meaning, but wouldst gabble like a thing most brutish, I endowed thy purposes with words that made them known. The idea is I taught you language. So when you savage, you did not know you, what you were doing, what you were saying, you would simply make noises like an animal. I gave your actions words so that you knew what you were doing. But thy vile race, race here, I guess you can mean bloodline, your family, your terrible evil family. I uh, remember his mother is the witch Sycorax. Though thou didst learn, had that in it which good natures could not abide to be with. So even though you did learn language, you know, we can hear him talking, yet something inside you is still evil which good people could not accept, could not live with. Abide to be with just means to live with. Therefore was thou deservedly confined into this rock, who has deserved more than a prison. 
Therefore, we locked you up and are treating you like a slave. You who deserves more than a prison. Basically, you deserve to die. This speech is pretty harsh. Right, my leader. Right, uh, we did our best for you. You are still evil, and so you are now our slave. And this is still treating you well because you deserve to die. Do you think this fits with Miranda? Or do you think this should be said by Prospero? Well, the truth is, up to this point, we have not seen Miranda interact with anyone else except for Prospero. Uh, and in the second act, sorry, in the second scene, she is just a listener, right? Prospero tells a story, she reacts to the story. So we don't really know what kind of person Miranda is. Yes, we are inclined to think that she is a kind 15 year old young lady, but we don't really know. This is the first time Miranda says something to somebody else. And it turns out she kind of talks like her dad. They, I guess they both agree about the situation. Um, and this creates some issues for our understanding of her character because later she falls in love with Ferdinand and then becomes the protagonist of a love plot. And if we think about romance, we don't think about this kind of language. So like, should this belong to Prospero or should it belong to Miranda? I think it could be either one. The point is to realize that Miranda is entirely influenced by her father. And of course, the, the, the main crime that Caliban tried to do is also a crime against Miranda. So she does have reason to be angry. But the language just seems very harsh and strikingly similar to the language of a master of someone who's in control. Right, as Miranda says, she tried to teach him language. She tried to teach him virtue to make him good. Master toward a uh, servant. And then we can also pay attention to the specific words that she uses. Savage. Brutish, like an animal. A vile race, an evil kind of people. Does that remind you of anything? It reminds me of British colonialism, Zimingjui. Like any time the British went to a new place and found the local people, they thought that these local people had no culture. We have to teach them British culture. We have to teach them how to behave. We have to educate them. We have to improve their lives. And if they don't want us to help them, then they are ungrateful uncivilized savages of vile race, of brutish animals. So in fact, when we think about Caliban, and I think we're moving into the next question, when we think about Caliban, we're also thinking about the relationship between someone who has power and comes from somewhere else and someone who was originally here and has less power. So like when, later in the play, when we read about Miranda falling in love, we should remember this section. She behaves very differently toward people that she thinks are her equal versus people who she thinks are beneath her. Yes, next question. Is Caliban treated justly? Uh, so this whole section. Uh, and it really depends. So like he did try to rape Miranda, that's true. 
but there's a little bit that happened before that. Caliban uh, complains about what happened to him. This, of course, for us is an excuse to learn about his history, but for him, he's complaining. This island's mine by Sycorax, my mother, which thou takest from me. When thou camest first, thou strokest me and made much of me. So like you, you treated me gently, you cared about me. Wouldst give me water with berries in it and teach me how to name the bigger light and how the less. So this is probably the sun and the moon that burn by day and night. Yes, the sun and the moon. So you came, you treated me well, you gave me sweets, you taught me language. And then I loved thee at that time. Then means at that time. I love thee and show thee all the qualities of the isle. Qualities here means the good parts. The fresh springs, chen shui, water from the ground. Brine pits, a brine pit is a salty pool of water, uh, which could also be useful. Barren place and fertile, so I showed you where to grow things and where not to grow things. Barren just means no uh, nutrition, no nutrients. Fertile means somewhere that could raise life. Cursed be I that did so. Uh, in Chinese, I guess we can say guy. All the charms of Sycorax. Charms here means like magic, curses. All the charms of Sycorax, toads, beetles, bats, light on you. So here he's cursing Prospero. For I am all the subjects that you have, which first was mine own king. So I used to be my own king, right? This was my island. But now I am your only subject. And here you sty me in this hard rock. You a sty is where you keep a pig. A pig sty is where you keep a pig. So he's saying you're keeping me in this rock like an animal. Whilst you do keep from me the rest of the island. So the island used to be mine. Now you're locking me here and you're using the island for your own. So, you know, when Prospero says, I took good care of you, I taught you, or Miranda also, right? I treated you so well, this is how you behave toward me. Caliban is using the same language, right? Uh, I, I helped you, I showed you the, the specific information about the island, and then you took it all away from me. This is how you treat your helper. Uh, and then, of course, Prospero disagrees. Thou most lying slave, whom stripes may move, not kindness. Stripe here just means hitting him with like a stick. It's called stripes because when you hit somebody with a stick, it leaves stripes on his skin, right? Tiaozhuang. So you only follow violence, you don't follow kindness. I have used thee, filth as thou art, with humane care. I have taken care of you, even though you are so dirty, even though you are so worthless. Filth means dirt. I have taken good care of thee and lodged thee in mine own cell. I let you live in my own room. So like Caliban says, it's just a rock. But Prospero says, this is my own room. Till thou did seek to violate the honor of my child. So I took good care of you all the way until you tried to rape my daughter. So this first meeting, their first interactions. We have two different stories. 
Caliban says, you treated me well. I helped you. Now you stole everything from me. Prospero says, I treated you well. Then you tried to rape my daughter. So what really happened? We don't know. But this is incredibly important, right? Depending on which story you believe, you will have a different answer to the question, is Caliban being mistreated? In other words, who is wrong first? In many ways, this is a very, very relevant question because this is the same logic that's going on in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine. Palestinians say that they lived there first. Israel, uh, the Jewish people came in the 20th century and stole our land from us. And the Israelis say that we treated you well, we wanted to be good neighbors, and then you kept on trying to kill us. So the logic here of these two different explanations is a very frequently seen logic in uh, historical conflicts. Anytime there's a, a fight about history or a war over history, you will see this kind of situation, two different stories of the same background. And so you can kind of see that the answer to these kinds of conflicts is not about which history is more accurate because you're never going to uh, convince the other side to believe in your story. The answer to this kind of conflict seems to be to try to start over. We're going to see that kind of ending uh, for this play as well. Prospero was unfairly stripped of his title of Duke of Milan. Milan was stolen from him, and so we expect him to take revenge. But the end of the play is not revenge. The end of the play is forgiveness. And that seems to be suggesting an answer to this uh, conflict as well. Maybe they have to find a way to set aside their history to try to work toward forgiveness. Of course, it's easier said than done, right? We know that's what should happen, but when the conflict is related to yourself, it's very, very hard to set aside this history. When, like, if you're an Israeli or if you're a Palestinian and many members of your family have been killed by the other side, it's very hard to say, I'm going to put that aside and I'm going to try to find a way to reach forgiveness with the other side. And, you know, that's a big reason why the war in Israel right now is continuing so ruthlessly, so aggressively, because it's powered by the sense of vengeance, or you can say the sense of justice. I think the best word for this is righteousness, fenkai. Righteousness is not always righteous. It just feels righteous. Question four. This was also a pretty popular question today. Uh, the most popular question was question five. Question four. Uh, so later we see that um, Ferdinand was also shipwrecked. He loses all his clothing. He falls to sleep somewhere on the island. Miranda discovers him naked and she says, oh, what a beautiful man. And Ferdinand wakes up and sees Miranda and says, oh, what a beautiful lady. They basically fall in love. But Prospero wants to slow things down. And the reason he gives is this line. Let's find this in the original play, 22454. Here. So 
these two have started falling in love, right? Um, let's see. So when Miranda first sees him, she says, I might call him a thing divine, something religious. For nothing natural I ever saw so noble. So he's so handsome, he can't be human, basically. And then when Ferdinand wakes up, uh, he says, Oh, if a virgin and your affection not gone forth, I'll make you the queen of Naples. Ferdinand is the son of Antonio, so he's royalty. So he says, if you are still a virgin and if you don't love anyone else, I will make you the queen of Naples, which means marry me and I will make you the queen of Naples. So they both love each other right away. Prospero says to himself, aside, right? He's talking to himself. They are both in either's powers, so they each love one another. But this swift business I must uneasy make. It's going too fast. I have to make it less easy. Lest too light winning make the prize light. Otherwise, if he wins her too easily, he will also treat her less uh, valuably. He will cherish her less. So he starts treating Ferdinand as hostile. Right. Uh, he says, thou dost here usurp the name thou owest not. So you're trying to take the title that you do not own. And has put thyself upon this island as a spy to win it from me, the Lord on it. So he's accusing Ferdinand of trying to take his power. Ferdinand, of course, says, no, as I am a man, I swear upon my human manhood, that is not true. Miranda, there's nothing ill can dwell in such a temple. Nothing bad can be inside such a like divine looking man. She compares him to a temple. If the ill spirit have so fair a house, fair means beautiful, good things will strive to dwell with it. So even if he is a bad man inside this beautiful body, uh, the body is so beautiful that it would attract a better spirit. It would improve his uh, person. Like she's just head over heels in love with him. So, you know, it is very fast, right? It's basically love at first sight. And that's why Prospero says, I need to slow things down, make it less easy. Otherwise, he will not cherish her as much. So the question is, does that make sense? And the groups that took this question all say the idea does make sense. Often we th when we think about romantic relationships, we think you have to work for it in order to value what you get. Uh, now, one group added the idea that this should not be the first thing that Prospero tries. He should try to talk with Miranda, try to communicate with her, tell her not to give in so easily. But he does. He does try to talk with her. Um, later here, let's see, where is it? Here. Thou thinks there is no more such shapes as he, having seen but him and Caliban. You have only seen, aside from Ferdinand, the only man you have seen is Caliban. And so you think that there is nobody else who looks like him, Ferdinand. Foolish wench, foolish young girl. To the most of men, this is a Caliban, and they to him are angels. So compared to most other men, Ferdinand looks like Caliban, and all the other men are angels as compared to him. 
So he's saying the only reason you think he's handsome is because you have never seen better men, but better men exist. In fact, Ferdinand is not handsome when compared to most men. And, you know, this makes sense. Miranda earlier does say that. Uh, she says somewhere that he is only the third man that she has ever seen. I can't find it now. But she knows that uh, here. This is the third man that e'er I saw, the first that e'er I sighed for. So the first that I fell in love with. Right, so she she's seen her father, she's seen Caliban, and this is the third man. So it she knows it should make sense. And yet Miranda's response is to say, my affections are then most humble. My love is not very ambitious. It's a very lowly kind of love. I have no ambition to see a goodlier man. I don't want to see a more handsome man. This man is enough. So she's lost, right? She's completely in love. In that case, it does make more sense for Prospero to try to interfere and make things harder for them. But back to the original question, does this idea make sense? If it moves too fast, he will cherish her less. In that case, how would you explain love at first sight? Some people might think uh, even if you think you have fallen in love, you should still work to try to confirm that you two are suitable for each other, that you really will cherish and care about each other. And that does make sense, but especially today, well, not especially, but like this brings up a bigger question of um, a timeline, like a Sijenzo the Winti. Prospero is saying they have to uh, go through more frustrations and efforts before they marry each other. But we also know that in the past, many people got married first and then learned to love each other. So like which one, like which logic seems to be the more suitable one here? If, it, if it's okay to marry somebody and then work to love them, then Prospero doesn't have to worry, right? He can let them get married and then later on uh, find a way, let them find their own way to love each other. But if you do need to make sure that you love each other before you marry, then how do you explain all of those previous traditional marriages where you get married first? So the point here seems to be that no matter the time of marriage, a relationship does require time and effort in order to be made more healthy and more solid. Yes, you might be attracted to somebody originally, but just because you're attracted does not mean that you are suitable for each other. On the other hand, with more time spent together, getting to know each other with a longer shared history, you would have more things supporting your relationship, and therefore it would be likely even more likely to succeed. We can take a comparison with something else, a passion for doing something like an interest. When you guys were applying for college, uh, one thing people kept asking you is what do you what do you like? What are you passionate about? Well, it turns out, according to research, people are interested in things that they have more experience with and that they are more successful at doing. So when we talk about interest and passion, we often talk about like, oh, this fits me as a person, my personality. Um, therefore, I like to do this. But in fact, studies have shown that 
whatever you choose, the longer you do it and the more successful you are, the more interested you're in, so that you are in it, the more passion you have for it. So could human relationships be similar? The more you work at it, the harder you work for it, the more you understand each other. Therefore, the more successful and long lasting the relationship can be. So in, in, from this point of view, Prospero uh, action and his idea does make sense. It's his only daughter. He wants to make sure she has a happy marriage. So he tries to slow things down. But now we can see that it's not a test or it's not just a test. He's helping them to create shared history together. He's making it ever more likely for their marriage to be a happy one. So like sometimes today when you know you fall in love with someone, uh, sometimes people will think, oh, I want to make sure that they really love me. I don't think that makes sense. What really should happen is uh, you want to try to build a shared history and shared memories with them and see if they fit in those memories with you. Like we, we sometimes hear about couples who fight all the time, who are complete opposites, who really don't fit together, and yet they have a successful relationship. And it's because they are able to fit the other person into their shared history, into their shared uh, experiences and memories. And they can kind of set aside or ignore for the moment the parts of the other person that don't fit. A successful relationship depends on the person, but it depends even more on the effort and the attitude. So from that perspective, uh, what Prospero is doing makes sense. And question five, how would you describe Prospero and why? Well, based on the information we already have from discussing the previous four questions, we can say that Prospero is he's a magician. He is the most powerful person on the island. He has a strong sense of storytelling. He tells a story to Miranda, he tells a story to Caliban, tells a story to Ariel. And these stories are the reasons for his actions. So he's a person who depends on his understanding of history. We can also say that he is a harsh master or a strict master. Whenever Ariel complains, he gets angry and reminds him of why Ariel should be obedient. Whenever Caliban complains, he gets angry and reminds Caliban of what he did to deserve this punishment. So and then, of course, he also thinks of himself as a good guy as somebody who tries to improve. He, he has saved Caliban. He has saved Ariel. He has helped improve their lives. So they should thank him and follow him. And of course, he also believes, I think in this case correctly, that he takes good care of his daughter, and so his daughter should also follow him. Although like when Miranda encounters Ferdinand, that question becomes more complicated. Uh, like, should she obey Prospero even in matters of romantic love? He always has his reasons. He always has a good sense of the historical causes of the current situation. Therefore, he thinks that he's a good guy. But we today who know about the evils of colonialism and trying to do good things for other people even when they don't want it, we can think more about this question. Is he a good guy? Is he really a, someone who has a positive effect on the people in this play? After all, he caused the shipwreck 
at the very beginning. Even if, if he thinks he has a good reason, that's usually not something a good guy does, right? This is a question that we can keep thinking about throughout the next two weeks, uh, as I think it's a very important part of the play. Is Prospero a colonist? Or is he a benevolent king? Or is he a control freak? Is he selfish, as one group said? Or does he really try to do what he thinks is right for the benefit of others? Uh, you know, I went to see Napoleon yesterday, and that movie also brings up similar questions. Every time Napoleon gets more power, he says, I'm doing it for France. I love my people. I love my country. But is that true? Or is that just an excuse? Or maybe it's both. Something to keep in mind. For next week, please. Uh, before next week, please finish. Um, that's not right. I think it should be please finish act three. Let me check. Yes, please finish act three before next week. 